And so we were we will conclude our message tonight with a word of prayer. Thank you. Yes, I'm ready to go home. That's good. Okay. There's two things I wanted to just say really quick. Uh, number one, I thank you, Mike. I I forgot to bring my watch tonight. And a lot of times when preachers say they forget to bring their watch, it's because it doesn't make any difference anyway. <laughs> right? But Mike loaned me his watch, so now it does. I'm on the clock. And the second thing I want to just mention briefly is that at the end of June, June 30th, uh, my wife and I, Sharon and I, are taking off for Asia for the, our mission projects this summer. And so we'll be reminding you of those things and so we can ask you guys for prayer um, and God's blessing on our travels. We'll be gone virtually all of July and Sharon will be gone most of July. And oh, one other quick thing, our youngest son. We have six children, by the way. Six children, almost 11 grandchildren and one wife. <laughs> Works out pretty well. And our youngest son is um, getting married this coming Saturday. So we're, we're really excited about all of that. And um, so I, what I have, what I want to do tonight is I want to take us through a journey through the book of Jonah. So if you have your Bible, please go to the Old Testament and the book of Jonah. And I'm already going to apologize because I, talking about the book of Jonah, I only have a few moments to be able to talk about it. So I'm going to talk about some life lessons from the life of Jonah. I could only scratch the surface on these life lessons. I wish I had four weeks, let alone one evening with you, but I believe the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will um, endear his word to your heart and open up your eyes and heart and mine as well to understand some lessons that God is teaching us about our day, our culture, and the message that we have to share to our world. I have four Five questions, three of them are why questions, and two of them are what questions. So when I read the book of Jonah, the first question I ask is, why is the book of Jonah in the Bible? You don't need to answer if you know the, if you have an answer, but I'm just asking some questions. I'm asking, so why is this book even in the Bible? What's the, what's the story? What's the purpose? What's the, mor the moral of the story? Um, why does this book in chapter 4 end so quickly and abruptly, where God says there are 120,000 people in this city that do not know their left hand from their, their right, and there are many cattle. Should I not have compassion? And that's the end of the story. Jonah, we're left with Jonah, uh, an angry man before God. And so why does this book end so abruptly? It's a good question to ask. <clears throat> why? Everybody asks this question. Why did Jonah run? and flee and disobey God's call in his life? You know what? I'd love to answer that question for you, but I'm not going to tonight. I don't think the answer is what we normally think the answer is. But I'm sorry, I cannot go into more detail about that. If you're interested, invite me over for coffee <laughs> and apple pie. Homemade. Number... Question number four, then, is what do we learn about God in this book? What do we learn about God? And then question number five is what do you or I do about this book, this story, this lesson? When we look at a fellow follower of the Messiah, Jonah. Jonah is his Hebrew pronunciation. Jonah. Can you say Jonah? Jonah. And that means dove. And so what we find here is a man who's called dove, but he's an angry dove, <laughs> and he's not a very happy one as well. There are four movements in this book, four movements, and there's a number of key words to the book. The word appointed is the key word. Another key word in this book is the word great. In chapter one, the great storm. In chapter two, the great fish. In chapter three, the great city. And then in chapter four, it talks about God, and we'll call him the great God, even though it doesn't use that word, but he is great. Amen? He's a great God. So you have the storm, you have the fish, you have the city, and you have then God. And so the whole story plays with your imagination, with this tempest, this mighty storm, and this massive fish. It's a whale of a story, really. This massive fish, and then this incredulous place that he has to go. Nineveh, all places, 
much more worse, more um, ungodly and pagan and terrifying than ISIS is today. This is where he was called to go. Much more terrifying than ISIS. And then the great God, so there's these four great words, and this is a great story, and it just plays with your imagination. And so let me introduce you to Jonah. I think I have to, I have to learn how to talk, and this is the most difficult thing for a preacher is to multitask here. So, and so Frank's been really getting good at it. So here's my life lessons from Jonah, God's relentless grace. And here, let me introduce you to Jonah. Well, Mom, I'm not doing so hot, but I am getting my daily fish oil like you always told me to do. In the belly of the fish, you've got a lot of that fish oil going on, right? So we're going to talk about Jonah. And I want to set it up. I'm not going to spend much time. I call him a bridge builder, building um, a man with a message from God to the people and people to God. And so here is God sending a man to build a bridge, a redemptive bridge between God and man. We call him Jonah. Jonah, I just briefly mentioned this because Jesus refers to Jonah, right, in the, in the Gospels. Here we have the references that Jonah, the Jews, they're not believing in Jesus. They're, especially the religious leaders, they're not believing in him. And they say, prove it, prove it, show us a sign. And Jesus said, the only sign that you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Jonah himself is the sign. It's not that Jonah did a sign. No, Jonah himself is the sign. And so they're scratching their head. What does that mean, Jonah is the sign? And so he refers to Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. A Hebrew idiom referring ultimately to the death, the burial, and the, say it with me, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. So Jonah is a sign of this. And also, I think it's very, it's, he's also a sign in this way, very ironic. Jonah is a Jew, lives in Israel. And God calls him to go to Nineveh, about 700, 900 miles long distance away from him, a Gentile pagan nation, ungodly. The Gentiles, the Assyrian, the, the Assyrians, they heard one message from Jonah's lips. And they all repented. They all turned their hearts, surrendered to God. And yet God had been talking to his people, Israel, oh, decade after decade after decade, and they rejected and they rebelled and they disobeyed. And so then God sends them into the Assyrian captivity and in the Babylonian captivity. How ironic. The people of God who should be responsive to the Word of God, the voice of God, don't listen to God. And then these Gentiles, who don't listen to God, finally listen to God, and they are right with God. How ironic. And so Jesus says, you guys are like the days of Jonah. The only sign that you're going to get is Jonah when the Gentiles received the Word of God, and yet Israel, at this time in their journey, rejected the Messiah. But he's not done with them yet, is he? There's a partial hardening that has come upon Israel, but there's a day coming when Christ returns and all Israel will mourn. And you can go into detail about that very, that very thing. So I just wanted to highlight that. So I want us to take a quick look at Jonah and the insanity of God. Read with me Jonah chapter 1. Verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up to me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So you can see where Tarshish is in relation to Nineveh and where he got the ship. And it, the Hebrew talks about Jonah paid the fare uh, like it was going to be not just for his own personal ticket, but he purchased the entire ship. He said, I want you to take me here and don't stop anywhere else. Don't drop any. I'm the only passenger. I want you to, uh, basically, I just want to go to Tarshish. I want to, 
I want to run, I want to go as far as I possibly can from this call. God's call, Jonah had a choice. Instead of going to Nineveh, he goes to Tarshish. Why? And he flees from the presence of the Lord. I don't think we understand what that phrase means. I believe biblically it means this. To, to be a prophet, if you know Elijah and the prophets, Elisha, they had an office, they had a position. They were the mouthpiece of God and they stood, Chronicle says, and they stood before the presence of the Lord. To run away from the presence of the Lord, Jonah knows that he's, he's not going to be able to ri- hide so that God can't, you can't see me. He knows that. That's not possible. In fact, if you read this story, he's very well aware that the Lord is able to see everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient and all these things, right? He's running away from his calling, from his prophetic office. He's ready to give it up and to disobey God instead of going to Nineveh. I'm on, I can't go into the details. You can read the story and try to put two and two together and discover why does he run? But he runs and he flees from the presence of the Lord. He gives up his prophetic call. To go to Tarshish. And I want to bring that to a lesson for us. Is that there's a choice that we have to make as well. Every day we struggle with Tarshish or Nineveh. God wants us in this world, our Nineveh, We're not to be of the world, Jesus says in John 17. We're in this world, a world that's in rebellion against God, fallen against God, and we are in the world, and God wants us to reach out to this world, and yet we have this daily struggle. We want to go somewhere else. We want to go where it's comfortable, where it's nice, it's pleasant. There's a lot of luxury in Tarshish. There's a lot of trade in Tarshish. It's a long way from this place called Nineveh. And we just daily struggle in our flesh, wanting to live for our purpose, our way, our agenda, our will, our comforts, instead of listening to the call and the voice of God. Is this not true? It is true. We all struggle in our flesh. And every day we must choose to follow the call of God by the Spirit of God, by the grace of God in our life, and not to give in to our fleshly temptations and our daily struggle. We all are tempted to go to Tarshish and not go and keep going back into Nineveh. There's a, um, a saying written by the author William Penn. He writes this, um, because this is the way of Christianity. The call, the call of God on a Christian's life to be involved in the mission of Christ in this world, one of the major reasons why we're here, the call of God is not a glorious call. I'm sorry, not a glamorous call. It's a glorious call. Do you know the difference? It's not glamour. It's not glamorous. It's not like Hollywood to be on mission for God in Nineveh. It's the last place you and I would choose to go. But it is a glorious call because it's going to make an eternal difference in someone's life. Eternal difference in somebody's life. And God values each and every one's soul. Everyone matters to God, right? And so it's a glorious call. It's not an easy call. It's not a glamorous call. It's the way of Christ. It's the way of the cross. And so William Penn writes these words, no, no thorn, no throne, no gall or bitterness, no glory, no pain, no palm, soothing, no cross, no crown. This is the way of the Christian life. Is it not? Yes or no? Amen. And Jesus was tempted this in his own life when he was in the wilderness going up against the devil himself. And so he went face to face with the devil himself and the devil says you can have all the kingdoms of the world on one condition. And what is it? That you bow down and worship me. You can have the crown without the cross, Jesus. And he would not take it. 
And Jesus is our pattern. He's our model. He's our hero. He's our leader. And He's inviting us to follow me. Follow me. And what did Jesus say about following Him? If you wish to follow me, take up your... How often? Every day. Every day. And follow me. We cannot be His follower of Christ, His disciple. We're not willing to say no to Tarshish and to say, I don't like Nineveh, but I will go. Lesson number one, and I'd like to just illustrate. There's a young man that I met a couple weeks ago, and I'm not going to give his name. He lives in a suffering, persecuted country. His name, I'm going to call him G. Burt. All right? G. Burt. Because I was just going to say Burt, but there's another Burt here. So how many Burts are in the room right now? Okay. So there's another Burt. So G. Burt, he, his father was a preacher, pastor, and he was reaching out to the Muslims in his country. He left his home one day, and G. Burt tells the story. Twelve days later, they found, they found his, his dad stabbed 26 times in the heart, murdered on the side of the road because of his faith and his ministry reaching out to the Muslims. He was 17 years old at the time. And he tells this story of how God took this heart, wanting revenge, changing and transforming that, and now he's offering a message of grace and forgiveness to the very people that murdered his father and destroyed his family and broke his heart. This man, G. Burt, has made a choice not to go to Tarshish, but to go back into Nineveh. I'll talk about him in just a moment again. So, first, my first point. And then, so I call that the insanity of God because God calls us to do some things. Really, Lord? Jindama? Really? Are you serious, God? You want me to go to Nineveh? But Tarshish is so nice. Have you ever considered Tarshish? Yeah. By the way, anybody having, it's still there. We can go on a cruise. We can go to Tarshish. By the way, Paul, remember Paul when he's in, in prison, he says, I'm going to go to Spain and I'm going to go to Tarshish. He says, the Tarshish, Tarshan people also need to know Christ as well. And so Nineveh, Tarshish, let me try Tarshish and see if that will work for a while, right? No. All right. Jonah and the great storm. I need a hustle on. I'm already on point one and that's, I'm done. Here we have the great storm. You know, the, the Bible talks a lot about storms. Can you name some? Big storm. Covered the whole world. What? I'm sorry, you're too far away. I cannot hear it. I can't hear I mean the Bible in the storms, like the flood. Joan in the storm. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27. Very similar story to this, that Paul's in a storm. Jesus in the boat with the disciples in the storm. Or the disciples in the boat without Jesus in the storm. There's a lot of things that God does with storms. And what we discover about God in this, in the first lesson is that God calls and has something on His heart, the people of this world. This is what we learn about God. And the second thing we learn about God is that God is in charge. He is sovereign over nature. And He can call up storms, He can create storms, and He can calm storms. And there's a storm that Jonah is in. Paul's in a storm. Different reasons. But what storms do in our life, we all encounter storms Trials, troubles, suffering, persecution, whatever you want to call it, they're all storms. And God reveals our faith through those storms. He renews our faith in those storms. He refocuses our faith through those storms. He refines, purifies our faith through those storms. Why? Because your faith and your Life, your soul is, is important to God. So He's not going to just let you walk on by. He's going to get your attention even when we walk away in disobedience. Now there's something that you can learn here about, about Jonah. Even, even, in our, even in Jonah's disobedience, God is sovereign. He can use the good, the bad, and the ugly in all of our lives, even our disobedience, to bring people to Him. Chapter 2 or chapter 1 of Jonah, verse 16. You know the story? Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. Who are these men? These are the sailors. They were worshiping all kinds of idols. 
They were polytheistic. They worshiped many gods. And then they throw, um, they're about to throw Jonah overboard and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh. They started learning to believe in the Lord God Almighty. And God uses even Jonah's disobedience to get the gospel to these sailors. It reminds me of a story when I was in my college campus days at the Ohio State University. We would meet together as a group and we would pray and then we would pair up and we go out and share the gospel on the college campus. And then we were done after a couple of hours, we all get back together and we would thank God and we would share what happened. I remember this one time we got back together and these two guys named Tom and Steve, Steve Hammond and Tom, one guy tall, one guy short, they went out together and they shared the gospel with this unbeliever, this pagan, and they started sharing the gospel and then one of them said something that the other didn't agree with. And so they started, no, 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 no. Yep, no, that's not how it goes. This is no, 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 no. And here's this unbeliever watching these two Christians argue over the gospel before him. And guess what happened? This guy got saved. How is that possible? So it's not the power of you or me. It's the power of God. Amen. Even in our craziness, in our insanity, God is able to work. And even in Jonah's disobedience, the point is here is that God is sovereign. And though I don't recommend this method of disobedience, because you're going to find yourself in the next chapter. You will find yourself there, Jonah and the great fish. God is in charge. He can create storms and he can calm storms. And he's refining, refreshing, renewing, refocusing your faith. Jonah and the great fish. You know what? In this chapter, I only highlight one thing that really struck me. Jonah is in the belly of the fish. The fish came just at the right time. It was big enough. And the fish says, look, a little pet. <laughs> in my fish bowl. And he swallows them. Because this was God's way of saving Jonah. The lesson you learn here is that God will never give up on his man or his woman. Even in your disobedience, God's never going to give up on you. Can you say amen to that? And what you discover in this psalm, in chapter 2, is, is Jonah is praying. He's not praying, save me, save me, save me. He actually, he's a praise. Thank you. You've saved me. It's the most unconventional way. There's no one else around. There's no other ship. There's no one around. So God brings the fish to surround him and saves him. And he says, thank you. And he prays. And then he offers his life once again to the work of God. Isn't that how it goes in our life? Lord, you've, you've been faithful when I've been faithless. And Lord, your mercy and your grace and your love melts my heart. My brother now lives in East Asia. Twelve years. When a long time ago, he had gotten to a place in his Christian life that he was just so discouraged and disillusioned about walking with the Lord, he almost threw in the, the, the towel God never gave up on him. And what broke, and what, what broke my brother's heart, what turned him around to get him stirred for the Lord again, and now he's serving him in another country for 12 years. It was this verse in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, which says this, it's the kindness of God. It's the mercy of God that leads us to repentance. It wasn't the judgment of God. It wasn't the wrath of God. It was the mercy of God. It was the kindness of God, the grace of God that melted my brother's heart. God, you've loved me this much. And so his heart was no longer hard and no longer stubborn. And he gave his life back to Christ. God will always provide a fish for you. He will always make you. We sing the song, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. Isaiah God will make a roadway in the wilderness. He can make a desert into pools of water. Yes, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He provides the fish, not to eat you up, to destroy you, but to save you and to deliver you. So Jonah 
and the great fish. God rules not only nature, but he rules over all the creatures, both great and small. He rules over that little goldfish that you have in your fishbowl, and he rules over the big fish that's in his God's fishbowl that says, oh, look, a little pet. I'll take him. But I need to move on. So I didn't give you my wonderful insights there. God does not give up on Jonah. God is faithful even when we are faithless. Jonah and Nineveh. Now here's something very interesting. So Jonah gets back on land and he hikes it all the way 700 plus miles to Nineveh. I want to read chapter 3, verse 2 through 4. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose, went into Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city going one day's journey, and then he called out. And this was his message, and this is all that's recorded. Recorded. I don't know if Jonah said anything more than this. He probably did, but it's not, nothing's recorded. It just says this, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. That's his message. And he goes right into the middle. He's right in the middle of Nineveh. Nineveh are the, the Assyrians, not Syrians, but Assyrians. And the Assyrian Empire came to the ten tribes of Israel and dispersed them, took them into captivity in 70, 722 B.C. Jonah went to, uh, I'll give you a hint, Jonah went, did not want to go to Nineveh because he didn't want the Assyrians to remain so that they, would, they wouldn't come down and destroy Israel. That's a hint. But Jonah went... <clears throat> The Assyrians, they repented, the city, the whole place, the, the um, emperor and all. Today, there are Assyrians in the world today. There are four million Assyrians, and you know, they're known as Christians. One man with a message that I believe turned a whole nation around, and the impact is still happening today. Because even out of disobedience and then getting right with God and walking in obedience to God, God is still bearing fruit from that message back then. Amen? Wow. And where is he? He's not in Tarshish sipping tea on a nice ham in a nice hammock. He's in Nineveh, right in the midst of it. John chapter 17, Jesus said, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one from the evil one. I am sending you, what did he say to the disciples? I'm sending you like sheep amongst wolves. Sheep versus wolves. You think there's any contest there? you got a, the sheep against the wolves. Who's going to win that battle? I go, Jesus, are you serious? In the Gospels, I've asked, I stopped at this passage and in the Gospels numerous times and said, are you serious? Jesus, do you know what you just said? You're taking sheep, your people, and you're putting us in the midst of wolves? What kind of shepherd is that? And I started to think about, you know what? Oh, okay, I get it. Jesus understands the true nature of our world. It's in rebellion to God. There, we, C.S. Lewis said, we are living in enemy-occupied territory. This is the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. And there's conflict. And the nature of our world is like a wolf. And when we come to Christ, He changes and transforms us from a wolf to a sheep. More loving and peaceful and fluffy and puffy. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm going, there's no way that sheep will survive against wolves. There are two things, there's probably more, but I just want to share with you, two things necessary to survive in this world as sheep. Number one, get around other sheep. Then you become a big white pillow, and we pillow attack the wolves. (laughs) No, the most important, yes, amen. (laughs) You like that? You can share that also. No, we, we, sheep need to stick together. But more important than that, sheep, along with sticking together, sheep must, listen carefully, this is the heart of this message here, you must stay close to the shepherd. 
Because you're, we are living in dangerous turf. And you, we better stay close to the shepherd. He's got his rod and his staff. And he knows how to deal with the wolves. You get close to him. So you make sure you're listening to Jesus. You're hearing, his, you're hearing his word. You're hearing his voice. And you're obeying what the shepherd says. Whatever it may seem insane, but you obey and you follow the shepherd. The shepherd goes that way, you go that way. He goes that way, you go that way. He goes this way, you go. You're sheep, he's the shepherd, stick close to him. If you like to be encouraged with that this week, I wrote this little booklet, a devotional called The Good Shepherd and Me. It's about my journey through Psalm 23. And I took every one of these pictures in here. That's a lie. Okay, so <laughs> see the last picture, the, the, the earth there? I took that. <laughs> So if you'd like some, I'll just give this to you. I, have, I brought a bunch of them on the platform there. You're welcome to take that. So here it is. Jonah is, went into Nineveh, the great city. Sheep among wolves. You and I need to stay close to the shepherd. This is God's call, God's way, not our way. Jonah said, Lord, I have a better idea. I'm not going to do what you say. I'm going to go to Tarshish, and we're going to reach Tarshish, and somehow we're going to reach the world from there. No, God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. It's not your way, Jonah. It's my way. You follow, you obey. And so Jonah ended up doing that. And so here in, in this country, let me just say this. You know, we've got culture wars going on. We have social wars. We have moral wars. We have spiritual battle. We're, we're in conflict. And our country, right before our eyes, is unraveling spiritually and morally. And it's really sad knowing what the heart of the founding fathers of our nation. But, I, you know, this is the heart of God. God is, doesn't just love this country. Guess what? God loves every country. He loves every people, every tribe, every language, every nation. And Jesus said, go make disciples of America. Yes, but not just America, right? Go make disciples of all the ethne, the people groups of this world. Make disciples. And I am with you always, even to the end. I'll be with you. The shepherd is with us, right? So this is our call, right here in our own backyard to the ends of the earth. And so I'll just put it this way. When I say the donkey and the elephant, do you know what I'm talking about? The donkey, the political party. The elephant, the political party. The donkey doesn't win. The elephant doesn't win. The lamb the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God wins. Amen? Amen? The Lamb of God, Jesus, our Shepherd, who's also our Lamb, He has already won and we are on His side. The sheep triumph! Woohoo, sheep! But I must move on. So Jonah and the plant, chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Please read with me. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, is this not what I said when I was in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from that disaster. What does Jonah say? He says, God, I know that you're full of compassion. That's why I wanted to disobey. What? I know that you're full of kindness and slow to anger. You're full of grace. And that's why I won't want to obey you. That doesn't make any sense. And not only that, he says, Jonah was angry that the Ninevites listened and repented and mourned and got right with God. And let me say this. Man, this would be a preacher's dream. An evangelist's dream. Here Jonah goes into the middle of, the, of this wicked city, nation, and he gives one message, and hundreds of thousands of people all got saved. No, and he said, man, I'm angry about that. Are you serious? I'm going to tell you the Hebrew here. Uh, here, read with me. Uh, next ver Another verse, it says um, in verse 9, but God said, to, well, start, verse 4, Oh, no, verse 3. Oh, no, verse 2. No, verse 3. <laughs> verse 3. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. You just saw hundreds of thousands 
saved with one message. No other evangelist, not even Billy Graham himself, saw results fruit like that. Please kill me. And then in verse 9, he says, but God said, oh, I'm sorry, verse 4, and the Lord said, do you have a right to be angry? Verse 9, but God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the plant? And he said, yes, and I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Oh, pardon my Francais, my French, but the Hebrew literally means, I am damn angry. That's what, God, that's what Jonah says to God. And God let him live. <laughs> He's really upset. And so then God, so Jonah puts himself outside of Nineveh, says, I'm going to sit here and watch and see what happens. And then nothing happens. God doesn't judge them. He actually uh, delivers them and lets them survive and live, right? Okay. And Jonah's very mad. So then God creates his plant to grow and gives Jonah shade in the August sun of Kansas City in all of its humidity, and he's just soaking wet sweat in the August Kansas City sun, like that's even more intense there. And so Jonah was so grateful for the plant. You know the story? Very, he had compassion on the plant. But then the next day, God appoints a worm and eats the plant, and the plant dies. And now Jonah is angry. Do you have a right to be angry over that plant? Yes, it gave me comfort. It gave me, you know, shade and all. And then God says... There are 120,000 people in this city that do not know their left hand from their right. Last verse of the book of Jonah. Read it with me. Verse 11. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and there's much cattle? God has a concern even for cattle. He has compassion on cattle. And your goldfish... What kind of people are there that don't know their left hand from their right hand? I would suggest to you that's referring to children who don't know right from wrong yet. There's 120,000 little kids, boys and girls, my grandkids, my kids' kids are in this city and Jonah wanted them all wiped out. And God says, I have compassion. You had compassion on a plant. And I planted these people in this world. They all have souls. And my heart goes out to them and I want them all to come into my family. God does never, He never gives up. He, he per, keeps pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. And He will give warning after warning. But then there's a day of judgment. But God is offering grace with truth to bring people back home to Him. And then the story ends. And we have no idea what happens to Jonah. Do you know why that is? I wonder if because we're sitting here tonight listening to the story and God says, you're Jonah, you're Jonah, you're Jonah, you're Jonah, you're Jonah, 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 Jonah. We're Jonas today. And our world is Nineveh. And what are we going to do? Be angry at God? Be angry that we no longer have our plant, no longer have our whatever it might be? Are we going to have a heart of compassion? What we learn about God in this story, I didn't tell you this, this story, the book of Jonah, it's not about Jonah. This story is not about Nineveh. This story is about God. The heart of God. And I'll tell you, I wrote here, I believe the moral of the story is that Jonah is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. You've heard it said probably in our day more than ever, is that the God of the Old Testament is not the same as the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is a megalomaniac, he's a tyrant, he's wrathful, he's full of judgment, and he's just out to destroy and commit genocide of these Canaanite nations and other nations. He's ugly. But the God of the New Testament is a nice little soft grandfather that could be farther from the truth. God, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same God, the Old Testament, New Testament, no difference. And here you discover, in the Old Testament, this compassionate God wanting these ungodly, rebellious, ISIS-type people to come to repentance. And guess what? He sends His people. God doesn't need to use people, but He chooses to use people, and He chooses to use you and me today. This is the story of Jonah. The moral is that God, say this verse with me, 
For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved. He didn't just love the world. He so loved the world. So there's a lot of life lessons in this, but here's the biggest lesson of all. The heart of God. And when God says, I want you to be my representative, my mouthpiece to Nineveh, say, okay, God, I'm going to forsake Tarshish. I'm going to Nineveh. I am in Nineveh. And we're going to... So here we go. Last slide. Um, Here's some things. Our broken world is Nineveh. And let me just offer some specific things to... If I can... um, Here we go. Number one is making sure that you're hanging your faith on the promises of God. Staying close to the heart of God. That says Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, which is a promise from God, and it says this, As the waters cover the sea, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. You know that promise? That's one promise. It's number two, number three, number four, and number five. Number two is to learn, continue to deepen your walk, with God, learning how to talk to Him, even being careful with respect, but tell God how it is when, it's in, when you're in Nineveh. Understand your Bible. Don't just take granted that you have a Bible. Read it. Study it. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Obey it. Put it into practice. Understand the Word and live it. Number four, live in covenant community. Like this community, this awesome gathering of people Loving one another, serving one another, the one another's in the scripture. We must demonstrate to our Nineveh, our world, that there's a different kind of community. Not wolf, but sheep. Live in covenant, a covenant where we are in this both, we're in the, you know the Bible term fellowship? Heard that word, fellowship? Nod your head if you've heard, you've heard of fellowship, right? You know what that word literally means? Well, let me illustrate it this way. It means a bunch of fellas in the same ship. And whether it floats or it sinks, we're in it together. Fellows in the ship. Partnering our life together. And then number five, share your story. If, you have, if you're a follower of Christ, you have a story. And then share Jesus' story and make and multiply disciples. That's how we reach our enemies. Share your story. Share Jesus' story. Get the message out. Get the word out. And let God do the work in the hearts of men and women. Amen? In a moment, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask us to listen to a song on CD. And then when you hear this song, you hear the chorus, once you get the chorus, you'll sing it out loud. We'll all sing it. And then at the end, we'll all stand up and sing the chorus out loud. Gilbert is the man's name that I was talking about. His father was stabbed to death 26 times. He, in the CD, he tells his story when his age was 17. And he says, on the CD, he writes a, sto- a song called I Forgive You, a different song. He says, I forgive you. And he tells about how he struggled in his heart, how he wanted to have revenge, and he, want- he hated whoever killed his father and broke his heart and broke up the family. But the Lord worked with him and brought him to a place where he could say, I choose, this is what he says, I'm quoting him, I choose to do what Jesus did for me. I forgive you. And he writes his song, not for himself, but he writes his song to get this song out to this community that murdered his father. You see, he comes from a culture that's a revenge culture. Wolves. He's writing his song in the way of Christ, Jesus is not a revenge culture. His way is not revenge. His way is forgiveness. It's a forgiveness culture. And with that message, I want us to listen to this song, Send Me Out. And then we will sing the chorus together, and then I'll close us with a word of prayer. Can we play?
a little soft, but you can listen really carefully. <laughs> It kind of works. I'll tell you what, while she's checking that out, turn with me to Jude chapter 22, please. 21, 22, Jude. And if it comes up, I'll stop. Um, Actually, just go to Genesis 1-1. We'll start from the beginning. <laughs> Here we go. to be those kind of people. Today, you're calling us as your mouthpiece with your message to a world that's lost. A lot of wolves, but you love wolves. You want to make them sheep. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you'll help us to be men and women that will listen to your voice, obey the shepherd, stay close to the shepherd, follow you wherever you lead us, even in the insane places, Lord. And I just want to thank you that you're a God full of compassion. You're a God slow to anger. You're a God abounding in loving kindness. You're a God full of truth and mercy and you're righteous and you're holy. And we have come to know you through our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. 
We thank you for all these things. And I pray that as we leave here, that we, this song will be resonating in our heart, that we would go to our Nineveh, our world, and make you known. Lord, as I pray, I would like to just ask you for anyone in this room tonight that's come to this worship service that still may be in Nineveh not knowing you. They've heard of you, but the heart is far from you. But now they see you for who you are, that you're a loving God, you're a gracious God, you're a God who values them. And I pray that you would open their eyes to receive you, Lord, in their life this very night, that they would no longer be a wolf, but they would be a member of your family, a sheep, by putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Help them to follow you, walk with you, and to be in good, strong community here. We ask these things in Jesus' name. We pray together. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Blessings on all of you. Thank you. God bless. Amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, oh. So I said, Jude 21, 22. I didn't mean to lie, so let's read it. <laughs> I'll leave you with this. This is a good little benediction. A doxology, Jude. You're probably already there. Pardon my forgetfulness. And this is how we go. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Amen? Amen. God bless. Amen.